Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of CR Arthritis at the Canadian Rheumatology Association and Arthritis Health Professions Association's annual meeting. I'm Kelly Lenvoy at ACE, and it's my pleasure today to speak to two leading rheumatology experts from the great province of Alberta, Dr. Stephen Cates and Dr. Jill Hall. Dr. Cates, the director of the Division of Rheumatology and section head for rheumatology for Alberta Health Services in Edmonton. Dr. Hall is a clinical associate professor, faculty of pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences at the University of Alberta. Welcome to you both. Hello. Thanks for having us. Now, we're going to cover two topics today. And the first one, the leading in with our uh, start here is around uh, an annual event at the annual scientific meeting. And it's something called the Great Debate. And both of you are participating this year in the Great Debate. And before we get into some specifics, maybe I'll ask you to describe to our audience what is this featured event at the annual meeting? I, I would say it's probably usually, maybe not this year, but usually a, <laughs> a highlight of the, the meeting where uh, we have two teams, usually uh, two from the West and two from the East, uh, two members in each team, uh, debating some topical subject in rheumatology usually making sure bringing good data but also having a lot of fun with it as well so there's usually smiles on everyone's faces uh throughout so i, I think uh quite the highlight because of that usually we'll, we'll can't say this year or not but. yeah I, I haven't participated but i've certainly been in the audience and Stephen, it sort of reminds me it's it's all fun and games until somebody gets hurt that's probably a good <laughs> <laughs> a good subtitle for it um so this year's great debate, as you said, it's usually, you know, focused around a, a hot topic in rheumatology. Um, this year, the great debate title is Be It Resolved That EMRs, Electronic Medical Records, Save Time for Healthcare Providers and Improves Quality of Care. And just a disclaimer for the audience, we're actually recording this before the annual meeting, before the great debate. So we're not going to be able to ask you about the experience. We're not going to ask you about winners or losers. Um, but we are going to get uh, a chance to um, take a peek inside uh, your, your arguments, your, your rationale for or pro uh, EMRs, because that's where you, uh, you're going to be resting this great debate. And full disclosure, um, Ace and myself are based in Vancouver, so I'm going to try not to let my West, uh, West Western Canada ba uh, bias enter into this at all. But <laughs> go Team Alberta! Um, so pro pro side, um, do EMR save time for healthcare providers and improves quality of care? So I think what we're interested in finding out is that we know. Um, uh, rheumatology, um, you know, the, the specialty focusing around autoimmune disease and musculoskeletal disorders involves real, really complex patient management. And EMRs, I think, have revolution, the, revolutionized the way healthcare is being delivered uh, in Canada, and probably particularly in an area like rheumatology um, with those special deans of, of patients and their interaction with the healthcare system. So maybe that is a, that is an intro you can give us um, at a high level where both are you where both of you are uh, approaching and sort of landing on this uh, on this topic. Yeah, I think that's a great introduction. I think I mean, so. So we are 
I was supposed to argue the pro side of, of EMRs, and I think so we're very ingrained in that right right now and, and would fully support that. I, I think your your comment though in terms of rheumatology really benefiting from this is is apropos. I mean, if I think back to the alternative to EMRs would be going back to a paper chart and, and that sort of thing to manage folks who have been sometimes on numerous different medications over many years and to track that and to track lab results and uh, different prescriptions and all those sort of thing. If you can imagine in a chart, paper chart thing, we get bigger and bigger and bigger to be able to leaf through that and find the information that you need uh, gets very complex. When you're talking about complex care and continuity of care, when folks uh, that we're seeing, usually we're not seeing one or two times, but over years, decades sometimes, right? Um, so having everything in an EMR right away makes things uh, more efficient, probably better care, and that everything's accessible really quickly and easily to be able to take a look um, at patient information. I think beyond that itself, I mean, just being able to to write or type prescriptions much faster, to look at labs and trend them over time. I mean, in Alberta, we're very lucky that uh, the vast majority of EMRs within Alberta Health Services, it's all one system. So anyone who has a lab done, we're able to see it. Doesn't matter if it's done in the south of the province, north of the province, we get to see it all and track it all at the same time very efficient uh, as well. We're able to create templates for notes so you're not recreating the wheel every time when you're doing that, which ultimately means you have more time to spend with your patient and less time in terms of needing to do the, the chart documentation part of things. Yeah, I think being in, in Alberta and having access to an electronic health record for a long time period of, of time, going back to 2006, we've had access to that lab work and diagnostic imaging and um, other facets of, you know, that patient health record across all sectors. So as a pharmacist, I'm always thinking about, you know, yes, what's happening in the hospital or in the ambulatory care clinics, but also what can pharmacists or other care providers, family physicians in the community see and access as, as well. So, I think it's hugely important for coordination of care, helping patients feel more confident that their healthcare providers across those different sectors have access to the same information and are able to communicate with each other through those electronic means as well, much more efficient than the dreaded fax machine, which I think is finally going away in in pharmacies across the, the country. So. Um, talking with with friends and colleagues in in other provinces, I think we're uh, leading in in this regard and in a lot of ways. And hearing about the the struggles and the challenges that don't even come to my mind when I think about providing care uh, in terms of do yeah documentation and and figuring out what has happened with a, a patient in in the recent past. So. I wouldn't have joined the team if I wasn't on the pro side. <laughs> our um, our audience and, and members here at ACE have heard us talk a lot about models of care in Canada. Um, and certainly in the context of uh, the gaps that are, you know, have been clearly identified in, in models of care. One of them is the, the access to care in northern, rural, remote regions of Canada in, in the northern areas of provinces and certainly in the territories. And we've actually talked uh, to Dr. Cates about that and specifically in the context of uh, treatment and care in the Northwest Territories and the role that um, he and other doctors in, in Edmonton have played in terms of providing those services for patients in, uh, in Northwest Territories. This, uh, this argument you're making seems to have some very real practical applications in that context. And maybe you can provide us some insights on that. Yeah, I, I think 
you know, again, if someone has their labs done uh, rurally in the past, it meant that there would be a delay upwards of a week of getting a lab result, for instance, right? Because everything wasn't interconnected. Uh, nowadays, it gets done, like I said, anywhere in the province, and I'm going to get it just as quickly regardless where it's done. And and we certainly still notice that gap. I mean, we don't think about it very often, but it, as you said, you know, right now we're seeing a lot of patients from Northwest Territories in Edmonton. Um, that's not integrated into our system. So there is, you know, a week or two weeks before we're getting those lab results, which then does potentially impact care. We see some patients from Saskatchewan, British Columbia as well, where again, it's not all integrated into our system. So uh, that uh, can interrupt care, the speed of care uh, as well. Uh, but in, you know, even with uh, when COVID started, there was opportunities, not that it's probably quite ready for prime time, especially in rheumatology, where doing physical exams is really still important but integrated virtual visits right into the EMR, we have that ability if we wanted uh, to as well. So I think there's lots there, probably a lot more yet to come, but uh, particularly for those populations, I agree that it's a great opportunity. Is there, um, I think from a, from a patient perspective, is there an opportunity or a facility where patients can interact with EMR, like, is there are there portals or access for people to be able to benefit and track their their own care? Absolutely. In Alberta, there's a few different ways through our uh, EMR. So in Alberta, the EMR is called Connect Care. Uh, there's a functionality which they branded uh, My AHS Connect, uh, which allows us to send direct, secure messages to patients. Patients can start those messages there on their own as well. So we can have uh, back and forth communication there, uh, which allows for quite rapid access uh, rather than needing necessarily to, to call the office, have someone answer, leave messages, that sort of thing. Uh, but at the same time, they're able to take a look at all their own lab results uh, for themselves and trend them and uh, review potentially what medications they're on, if there's any uncertainty there and, and really have access to to the information that belongs to them. I think it's really neat too in, in clinic when patients come in and, and say, you know, sometimes I had my blood work done last week. Did you see it? You know, could, do you have access to it? And, and I can show them that it's already loaded automatically into my template note in the EMR. And, you know, it, it highlights anything that's abnormal. I can reassure them, but oftentimes too, patients are coming in and said, you know, I had my lab work done. I noticed my CRP is high. Is that a problem? Like, is that something I need to be concerned about? And so, you know, having both sides of that patients just aware um, that they can ask questions and, and in a way advocate for them themselves in terms of, you know, what is going on uh, with respect to, to their medications, but also get clarity around, you know, a number is high or low, and are, is that something we are concerned about? Uh, and take that that opportunity to learn about that that facet of their care as well. That's that's excellent. I think what we'll try and do at the end of this uh, of this episode is uh, provide some links if we can find these links for uh, for each province and territory. I think that'll be mm. a really valuable uh, tool for patients. Um, certainly, we talk to our audience a lot about self-care um, as one of the key elements of, uh, of uh, models of care for arthritis, um, and particularly for people living with inflammatory um, arthritis diseases, which again are very complex, complicated. Um, this is something that, that's really, really important, and it just would seem to me it would promote things like adherence as well, that you would probably see um, some really positive results there. I want to continue in this on this theme of um, patients being sort of at the center of this healthcare team around them. Um, we we like to say they're the QB um, and or captain of that of that team. I want to just turn um, from a focus on electronic medical records or EMRs. And I think Dr. Cates mentioned how it can enhance uh, sort of this multidisciplinary approach uh, to patient care um, and turn our attention to that. It's, um, it's a term that 
I think a lot of our members have been hearing about and reading about for quite a while now, for at least you know a decade or two, we've been hearing about multidisciplinary care. We've been hearing about integrated care. Um, and I know this is something that both of you um, are leaders in, um, are co-leaders co actually of, a, of this team-based approach um, in Alberta. And I'd like to hear a little bit more um, about um, your, your definition of multidisciplinary care and how it can benefit um, arthritis patients. I'll jump in maybe and uh, sure. talk about, so I think within the, the broader multidisciplinary clinic that we operate in, you know, we have access to and connect with um, really readily through the EMR. Um, <laughs> they're not just down the hall, but, you know, our nurse colleagues, uh, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, social workers, all of the, the team members that are really important to patients who have an inflammatory arthritis or other musculoskeletal uh, disorder. But within our particular practice, you know, we're, we're really um, an integrated collaborative interdisciplinary model where um, we work together and with that patient being the the center of our of our team to provide care so we as i guess pharmacists in alberta um, are lucky to enjoy the broadest scope of practice in the world and so myself as a pharmacist working with patients who have a prior diagnosis of an inflammatory arthritis i'm able to do what pharmacists do which is making sure that medications are effective and safe for um, the conditions that they're being used for, and also that patients are able to adhere. So whether that's cost concerns, whether that's you know the, the formulation of the particular product or its adverse effect related and working with patients in that aspect um, and you know making changes, prescribing, ordering lab work, following up with, with patients to make sure that they're getting the most out of their medications for their arthritis. And, and we collaborate. So, I mean, in our clinic, I see patients and, um, you know, Stephen joins the conversation um, and, you know, we finalize and, and settle on a, on a particular plan for that patient on, on that day. But I'm also lucky I have a little bit more time in, in clinic with follow-up type of, of patients and, can talk to them about other medication related concerns, things like their cardiovascular health, knowing that folks are at higher risk for those types of events, as well as vaccines. And um, we did a lot of work together during the COVID pandemic and, um, you know, surrounding times, making sure that our patients were really aware of what their risks were, how they could help to, to decrease those risks, risks and when and how uh, to, to get vaccinated. So I don't know what you would add to that, Stephen, but um, I think we've got a really a neat practice together uh, in the way that we work with patients. Yeah, I 100% agree. It's it's excellent care for patients. We've, we, we know, we, we've, we've looked at it and patients appreciate this model of care um, compared to what would be the old physician-only uh, model of care. Um, I think they recognize it's it's better and, and more integrated for them. And not only does it provide better care, but it also improves overall access because as Jill said, while she's seeing these patients, I'm also seeing patients as well. So in that in that clinic time, we've probably increased capacity by about 50%, uh, which so if this was something that we were able to make, you know, the standard, you know, nine to five Monday to Friday for, across the board, uh, the, the impact would be absolutely huge in terms of uh, wait lists and all that sort of thing that we are all struggling across, uh, struggling with in, in Canada right now. Yeah, it reminds me of another one of these uh, terms that people come across on the internet or when they're reading some story in the media, and that's phys physician extender. Um, 
and really, I think what that means in the context of what we're talking about, and Dr. Case, I'll come back to you, is if we allow, and, and I think Barnes is a great example where they have had sort of that formal expanded scope and governments have recognized it and have enabled it, but we're still working really hard to have that kind of um, accreditation and acknowledgement for, let's say, physiotherapists and a lot of our our, our audience and our patients spend a lot of time with um, physiotherapists. And then you mentioned occupational therapists, chiropractors, dietitians, um, social workers, it's all part of that of that multidisciplinary team that patients have. But when it comes to the benefits for patients receiving more comprehensive care, it also, it means they have a different type of relationship with their rheumatologist. Would, would you agree with that assessment? If, if we can, if we can expand the role of these other practitioners. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it, it can, but again, our, our data, which we've shown before is, Patients, you know, I, I could see maybe some folks feeling that connection isn't the same. I think um, we haven't noticed that ourselves of being concerned. Like I said, I think all, all our patients are very positive uh, about it or very, you know, I, I'll sometimes hop in the room at the end for 30 seconds. Do you have any questions? No, because Jill's covered absolutely everything. They're very confident right. in yeah. that air. Um, so I, I I, I think for some people, maybe there's a change of, of how and what they expect in terms of care, but certainly I'm very confident in terms of the maintaining and, and really ex exceeding the quality of care that we would expect just from the rheumatologist uh, in that care would actually is better in this model. Right. Yeah. And, and I think. This, go ahead. I was just going to say. The specific medical care that they need to get from their specialist, they now have more opportunity. Yeah, and I they're I mean they're still connected to their rheumatologist. So I was gonna say if patients, you know, go away and have a flare or have a question that comes up, that might come through the EMR and it might be Stephen or I who who answer that, right? And and so we're still it's it's a it's team based care. Um, they have more access in a in a way or a broader you know, scope of, of knowledge and skill than, than a patient who is, is solely seeing a rheumatologist. I, I'd also like to point out to our audience, and we'll, um, again, we'll provide links at the end of this episode. Um, there are other best practices, um, not only yours in Alberta, but in other jurisdictions in Canada as well. Um, I'm thinking of British Columbia, where for, I think, at least 10 years now, um, there's been a a billing code for rheumatology nurses. Um, and that is really, I think, helped transform the practice of rheumatology for specialists uh, in the province. Um, getting that help with, and patients getting uh, better served in terms of initial assessments and patient education. Um, so that's been, I think, a really good example and there are some leaders in in British Columbia who we've talked to about that and also I'm, I'm thinking in Ontario um, there's a model of care using what they call non-physician admitted role practitioners um, ERPs which is a little easier to remember in arthritis care um, and these ERPs receive uh, training from a program called Advanced Clinician Practitioners in Arthritis Care, ACPAC. And that's a training program uh, developed to um, help prepare physical uh, therapists, as we've mentioned, occupational therapists, chiropractors, nurses in the assessment and management of arthritis. And we just had a, um, we've just, shared breaking news in Ontario where um, that model is being applied in Northern Ontario through the work of the Ontario uh, Rheumatology Association. So there are, there are examples out there and uh, you being one of the leaders, I think, you know, what we're hoping is this spreads across the country in, in every province and territory. Um, anything else? that you want to share um, about 
your your practice, your focus. Any final words? No, I, I would just agree with, with what he just said. And I think it's really the only path forward in rheumatology in, in Canada. We're not training enough rheumatologists um, over time. That's not going to suddenly fix itself. And if we don't uh, seriously look at and embrace uh, these new models, uh, we're, we're not going to be able to improve access and quality of care for all of these really important folks who deserve it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think those are great final words, and I want to thank both of you for taking time from both of your busy practices, but I guess more importantly, um, some of the advanced work you're both doing right now preparing for the great debate. So I know your time is very valuable and precious, so thanks for sharing some of it with us. And uh, again, from, um, from a, a peer in uh, BC, I wish you the best of luck in the great debate coming up, and I hope you represent the West as well as I know you're going to. So good luck with that, and um, thanks again for joining us, and thank you, our audience. Um, this is uh, CR Arthritis, our 10th consecutive year at the annual meeting, and very happily bringing you insights and knowledge from experts at the conference like we've enjoyed today. So thanks again, both of you, and we look forward to seeing you again on another episode. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kelly.